Well, welcome and thank you for joining today's webinar on Entity Structure for Community Composters, Co-ops, Nonprofits, For-Profits, Oh My. Uh, my name is Brenda Platt and I head up our Composting for Community project at the Institute for Local Self-Reliance. We're offering this webinar today. It's one in a series that the Institute offers to advance composting. and. This one today is part of our uh, community compost law and policy project that the Institute for Local Self-Reliance has joined with the Sustainable Economies Law Center. Um, and we're leading this project to provide legal and policy support to community composters who, as many of you know, face daunting regulatory zoning and permitting barriers. So together with uh, the Sustainable Economies Law Center, the Institute is producing a legal guide to community composting, as well as a guide to best management practices for community compost sites. And next year, we'll be launching a policy mapping project. So stay tuned uh, for some of those resources. I uh, wanna let folks know that um, in June of this year, June 19th, we held our first webinar on policy issues, which was a discussion with community composters on some of the uh, key issues on legal and policy um, uh, issues that were confronting community composting. So that's recorded, so check it out if you'd like to see that. Um, uh, today, Janelle Orsi with the Sustainable Economies Law Center will explain considerations related to cooperative nonprofit, for-profit, and hybrid models with the help of Kate cartoons. Um, and it's an important topic because the entities we choose and how we structure them can really impact how community composting is treated by regulators and policymakers. Um, but before we uh, dive into um, uh, dive into her presentation, we're gonna just do a few quick polls to find out um, who's on the line. So Virginia Streeter, my colleague, is helping with that. So let's see the first poll um, question, which will be, where are you? Are you in the Northeast, Mid-Atlantic, Western, Southern, Midwest, or outside the US? All right, we have almost three quarters participating. All right, let's show the results. Hmm, underrepresented in the South, something to note. Okay, all right, next is just getting a sense of who's on the line. So are you with government? Are you, are you actually a community composter? Um, are you an other composter or hauler, not really community scale? Are you an urban farmer, community garden? You can select more than one or other. You don't fit into any of those categories. Now, there may be a little bit of um, double counting in this one. So we have more than 80%. So let's show the results. All right, almost half are community composters and one third other don't fit into any of those buckets. Interesting, okay. So the next poll, we wanna just get a sense of how you would describe the structure of your entity. So this is really for just composters, if you will. So if your government, you know, um, uh, just please don't participate, uh, but um, let us know which bucket, and you only get to select one this time. Which one best describes you? Try to get a little higher percentage of you voting. Let's see. Um, still votes coming in. Okay, we only have 57% of you voting, so I'm gonna assume that the rest of you um, didn't consider yourselves a composter, so. All right, one quarter nonprofit. 13% cooperative, one quarter for profit, and a quarter haven't figured it out yet. Well, this webinar is for you. All right, without further ado, um, I'm gonna introduce uh, Janelle while Virginia's um, handing over the uh, controls to Janelle. I'll introduce her and I'll just remind people in your window, there's um, of the GoToWebinar uh, panel, there's a, uh, you can select questions and 
type in your questions there and at the end we we'll, hopefully we'll have plenty of time for your questions so feel free to um, start typing at any time during the webinar. All right, so Janelle Orsi is a lawyer, advocate, writer, and cartoonist, and she's focused on cooperatives, land trust, sustainable agriculture, compost law, community-owned community energy, shared housing, and the creation of a more just and equitable society. She is the co-founder and executive director of the Sustainable Econ Economies Law Center, which is based in Oakland, California, and she's author, also the author of Practicing Law in the Sharing Economy. So take it away, Janelle, and welcome. Thank you so much. Okay, uh, let me know if you have any trouble seeing my slides or hearing me. Um, we can see everything, and you sound great. Okay, good. All right, so here we go. So just a little bit more about why we wanted to have this webinar. I mean, of course, Every business and composters are no exception. Um, always has to answer the question of just how do we want to structure ourselves? What kind of entity do we want to choose and so on? Uh, but this is also a question that matters not only for the enterprise, but it kind of matters for the whole community compost movement because we're at a time right now where a lot of laws are being made regarding composting and there's a potential to make the laws in a way that privilege or remove barriers to certain types of entity structures in the community compost movement. So I'll say more about that. Um, just a little bit more background. Sustainable Economies Law Center, we've given legal advice to over a thousand grassroots groups, social enterprises, cooperatives, and so on over the last six years. And so we've we've spent a lot of time navigating the legal gray areas and thinking about the the considerations when you're choosing and structuring an entity and it's it's really never a simple choice uh, there's a lot to think about and so i'm always trying to think of better ways to explain it to help basically help people think through it on their own and that's part of why i draw cartoons is to just try to break things down a little bit better uh, let's see so i chose cake and the reason i chose cake is because oftentimes when i hear lawyers describe the types of entities you can form for a business, they do it in a way that really kind of mashes up the concept of entity and tax status and other considerations. Whereas I like to break them down in this way and basically say, well, the cake that you, the part that you bake is the entity that you choose. And that's typically a choice you make at the state level. You generally file papers with your secretary of state and choose an entity. And then on top of that, you um, choose a tax status, and you that's the icing. Um, and you usually choose that considerations that, sorry, I'm using a phone. I'm like, what is beeping at me? But just yell at me if you can't hear me. <laughs> um, so yeah, the tax status is something you choose at the federal level, usually to get some kind of tax benefit. But then there's the ingredients of the cake. And the ingredients are, there's just an infinite variety of, of choices you can make at the level of the ingredients. So, and that in many ways is what, what really gives flavor to the cake. So, um, yeah, so I, I would say in, in most people's experience, when you're forming an enterprise and operating it, the thing that really, yeah, really gives it flavor or really affects your day-to-day -day experience of it it, a lot of it has to do with just the choices you make about how you operate, how you govern yourselves, your financial choices. That's the stuff that really matters. So I don't want to say that the entity choice and the tax status don't matter because they do, um, because both of those things come sort of baked in with certain kinds of characteristics and requirements. But the reason why those things can be very important, and especially for composters, is that the entity choice and the tax status are things that policymakers and regulators, government workers can more readily understand. They're the things that you can sort of stand back and look at a cake and know about a cake or a, a, business, a business and be able to understand some things about it. Uh, they're objective criteria basically that policymakers can look at and potentially build certain benefits around. And like I said, this is a really timely moment to consider the choices of entity and how that could impact policy because there are just i like to say loads of compost laws that are being made right now and for various reasons some of it's that we we want to get organics out of landfills and 
reduce methane emissions. You know, there's a lot of reasons why why states, cities, and counties are beginning to create a lot more laws that require people to compost, that create integrated composting systems. And so while these laws are being made, there's a lot of risk that the laws are gonna be made in ways that really privilege large scale composting operations, large scale haulers. And we see that not only because the licensing and the regulatory requirements are designed for large scale, but also because in some places, localities are giving monopolies to large, large scale haulers, basically giving them exclusive contracts. And so both of these things can make it very hard if you're a small scale, community scale composter to say like, hey, what about us? You know, how are you gonna create licensing requirements or regulatory requirements that are better scaled to what we're doing or more appropriate for our size or our structure? And this is this is where the entity structure can really matter because we can we have an opportunity now to be in conversation with policymakers as these laws get made to say, you know, can you give us exemptions from certain regulations? Or can you even give us certain benefits, certain um, subsidies or public funding, preferential contracting on the basis that we're different and we're, we're different than the big scale for-profit haulers. Um, and so when you ask policymakers to do something like that, you, you generally need some kind of objective criteria to point to. Size is very, that's an easy one. There are a lot of exemptions created for small scale composting. There's also exemptions and special programs designed around the particular composting method. For example, vermicomposting in California is exempt from uh, compost facility registration requirements. But then the other one is entity structure. And we're beginning to see policymakers listen to suggestions that certain types of entities for community compost operations should be exempt. Um, and it tends to be nonprofits and cooperatives. Uh, so I also created this chart um, as sort of like two major areas of consideration for policymakers when they're sort of breaking out different tiers of regulation or creating programs um, <laughs> that both like on one one access size of, is a consideration, but on another access is just like, what is the entity structure? Is it the type of entity that's designed for shareholder benefit as in a for-profit type of en enterprise, or is it designed for community benefit, which tends to be nonprofits and cooperatives. Uh, and that that's a really, in many, many other areas of law, that's a huge consideration in crafting regulations. And a lot of financial regulations, uh, you see special categories or special exemptions for nonprofits and cooperatives that are structured for community benefit or stakeholder benefit. And so, Maybe two of my biggest points for this webinar are, one is that a major determining factor, if you're trying to choose an entity structure for your composting business, might be the potential for you to gain policy advantages as a result of your choice. I mean, other, other kinds of industries maybe don't have to think about this so much, but the fact that compost laws are being written right now and the fact that compo compost laws can really make or break your enterprise uh, might mean that you really want to think about the policy angle in your choice of entity. And that also means that just depending on how you view nonprofits and cooperatives, you might need to challenge some of your preconceptions about what nonprofits and cooperatives are. And I'm going to try to boil them down to some of their more essential elements. But I hear people say things a lot um, when I talk about nonprofits. They think, well, you know, I don't want to spend all my time asking for donations or people might say, well, I need to make money. And, you know, these are these are conceptions that you might get by, you know, looking around at the nonprofit sector or it might be based on your limited experience with nonprofits. But but there's nothing essential in nonprofits that say that your income has to come from donations or that you can't make money. Um, and. Um, same with cooperatives. A lot of people think of cooperatives and they imagine like groups of people sitting around in long, long meetings, trying really hard to make decisions. And, you know, <laughs> again, there's a lot of room to move. Um, and that's in the ingredients of the cake, really, like in the policies and the practices that you adopt. That's, that's where you can make a big difference. Um, so yeah, those are two key points. Okay, so back to the cake. Um, when you are choosing the actual cake, 
the entity that you choose at the state level. I like to break it down and say that there's three general categories. And it, it really varies from state to state, but um, as a general rule in every state, there's some kind of public benefit, nonprofit, corporation that you can form. <laughs> there's usually some kind of um, mutual benefit organization or multiple kinds, uh, which includes cooperatives. There are also things called mutual benefit nonprofits. Uh, and then there's for-profit entities, and there's usually a variety of those. And I include in those benefit corporations, social purpose corporations, and, and other things that even though they build in some kind of public benefit elements are still at the end of the day shareholder owned, uh, and they do operate for the profit of their shareholders. So I'm just gonna talk through some of the basics of entities and um, starting with sole proprietorships. So sole proprietorships are magically formed the moment that you start doing business. So you take a client and you charge them or you sell a product for money. That sort of magically creates a sole proprietorship. Um, so I have a law office and it's just me and it's a sole proprietorship and I didn't have to do anything formal to create that sole proprietorship to form that entity. That was by default of the law, what I created. Similarly, if you and another person get together and you start doing business together, you instantly form a partnership. Whether or not you file any paper, papers, the fact that you and someone else are doing business together, that instantly creates a partnership. Now, it doesn't mean you don't want to create any paperwork. You probably do because usually partnerships have something called a partnership agreement that irons out the details with you and your partners on how you make decisions, how you allocate profits and losses and so on. And it's also very common for partnerships to file or register with the state just to sort of put the state on notice that, that you exist and you probably want your own tax ID number. Um, and so there, there are more formalities involved in partnerships or, or you should um, basically take a few more formal steps even though the default is doing business with someone else basically creates a partnership. Um, so sole proprietorships and partnerships don't come with limited liability. And a lot of times people want limited liability, but I also wanna take a moment to say, what does that mean? It sounds good, because it kind of sounds like, well, you're gonna be protected from getting sued, which in some respects you are. But what it means, it doesn't mean that your business is protected from getting sued. So if somebody gets injured in connection with your compost enterprise, they can still sue your business. Um, so the fact that your business can get sued by workers, by other people who are harmed by it, that's why you get insurance. But what limited liability means is that there's a liability shield for you as an individual owner of the business. So if somebody sues the business, they can get at the business assets but the idea is they can't sue you individually and get at your assets. So corporations and then anything with an LL in it, like limited liability company, LLC, those are the things that generally have this liability shield. But I also like to point out that there's limitations on this liability shield. Um, it, it applies to yeah, harm that your company causes. It, it also applies to debts that your company owes meaning that you as an individual will be protected from those, maybe. Um, and the idea of this, all of this is just that you are, you are like separate from your company and that you're not 100% responsible for everything that happens in your company or what it does, that you know, if, if something go, goes wrong, people can sue the company, but not you. But here are the limitations, which is that if you personally guarantee any debt, or if it's actually you acting in some negligent way, you as an individual acting in a negligent way, you can still individually be sued. So I will say the liability shield, in some ways, I tend to think it's overrated, and it's weird for a lawyer to say that. Lawyers usually say the opposite. Um, but I will say a lot of people go to form a limited liability company or a corporation, and it's like the very first thing they do to start a business. And I tend to encourage people to wait a little while and kind of see how their business takes shape. Um, but the moment you do start to take on a lot of risk, um, meaning you've hired employees or you've taken on a lot of clients, then you might want to consider the liability shield. 
in some states, forming a, an LLC or a corporation can cost a lot of money. Like in California, it's an $800 a year minimum tax, which is part of the reason why I tell people to wait, because that's a high cost that comes along with any kind of limited liability entity. Um, other states, I have to say, it's much, much cheaper. Um, so a little bit more about the entities, limited liability companies. If you are trying to choose between that and some kind of corporation, the benefits of an LLC tend to be just that there are fewer formalities, your documents are simpler, and this is a big one, the final one, is you, you likely don't need to treat yourself and your other co-owner managers like employees. And this is, as a lawyer, I'm constantly ruining people's day when I'm giving them advice and they're talking about this great new enterprise they've started and they've formed a corporation of some sort, like a cooperative corporation or a nonprofit corporation. <clears throat> and then I tell them, well, you know, you're working for this entity. You really need to be treating yourselves like employees. And that means getting workers' compensation insurance, adhering to wage and hour laws. And a lot of times when people are just getting started, they can't afford that yet. Uh, there's also reasons related to immigration that people don't want to treat themselves like employees. So um, this can be a major consideration just depending on how much capacity your business has to actually treat people like employees. So corporations, there are many types and it does vary from state to state exactly what they're called and how they work. Generally, they come with a long set of rules about how you operate. They're usually required to have boards of directors and those directors are required to have meetings and to keep minutes of the meetings. So a lot more formalities. Um, but yeah, like I said, there's, there's different types. There's the for-profit varieties, there's public benefit varieties, and then mutual benefit and, and cooperative varieties. Not in every state, but most states have all of these or some, some variation on them. Um, yeah, this is just a slide about the, the employment issue that I brought up a second ago. Um, so basically, anytime you form a corporation, and this does vary a little bit from state to state, uh, but if you're working for it, you probably need to be treating yourself as an employee because it's really the assets of the company are really considered to be separate from you. They're owned by the corporation, it's, as they say, a separate person. Um, so yeah, just a few other considerations that I've noted. It's just that corporations come with a lot more formalities than LLCs, partnerships, sole proprietorships. Um, and then anything with a limited liability piece might come with extra costs of just minimum taxes or annual fees that you pay to the state. So a lot of people have heard of something called a B corporation or B corporation certified. Just wanted to call that out, but also say it's not a type of corporation, it's a type of certification. And it's largely based on your policies and practices. And so to get the certification, uh, B Labs, the company that administers it, looks at your practices and your policies, and then if you are adhering to certain social and environmental goals, they'll give you the certification. So it's different than things like a benefit corporation. A benefit corporation in some states is an actual type of corporation you can form where it's shareholder owned, but you can also build in certain public purposes, uh, but that's different than this certification. So, all right, so I just talked through the cake part. I'll talk a little bit about icing now. Um, so yeah, you form the cake usually by filing paperwork with your state, often the Secretary of State. Um, and then you choose the icing. And that's almost always a federal consideration. You look at federal tax law um, and it's something that the IRS administers. I've also replaced Uncle Sam here with Aunt Sam. Uh, for illustration purposes. Okay, so there are lots of kind of tax categories. I'm not going to go into a ton of detail about most of them because we only have an hour. Uh, it can be a little bit technical, um, and I really want to emphasize one or two different categories for this webinar. Um, but yeah, there's about 29 different 501c categories, and then there's a variety of other categories. But if you hear people say something like, C Corp or S Corp, that's actually referring to a tax category as opposed to a type of corporation. So that's, that's why I like to break out the cake and icing and talk about them separately. 
Um, and I, what the thing I failed to mention is that you can really mix and match. You can take one kind of cake and get a particular type of icing for it, but you could probably also choose other icings. Um, and that's why, in many ways, there's a, almost there's not an infinite variety of things you can do, but there's many more combinations than than what you'll get if you look at just a general like resource on choice of entity. So about taxes. So if you're a sole proprietor, generally you can just, you, you don't have to file an extra tax return. Um, so I'm a sole proprietor for my private law practice, separate from the Sustainable Economies Law Center. And it's very simple. All I have to do is file a Schedule C with my taxes and I put on my, my business income, my business expenses, I pay taxes on it. Um, note that if you are self-employed as a sole proprietor or you have a partnership, um, you are generally going to pay self-employment tax, which is which is roughly the same amount that your employer would pay toward your payroll tax. This is the Social Security, Medicare contributions, roughly amounting to about 15%. Um, but yeah, just want to give you a heads up about that because a lot of times people are caught off guard by it, by it and don't realize that when you're self-employed, you really have to pay, it feels like, more taxes. Uh, but it all comes out roughly to the same as employment taxes. Um, and then any other entity that you form, whether it's a partnership, a nonprofit, LLC, you're going to file a separate tax return for that entity. So it adds a layer of formalities. Uh, partnerships and LLCs default to subchapter K taxation, which is also known as pass-through taxation, uh, the owners of it are considered to be self-employed, so they pay that self-employment tax on it. Um, but the pass-through taxation basically means that all of the profits and the losses of the business get passed straight through to the owners rather than having the entity pay taxes on it. So it's all of the owners that pay the taxes on it, not the entity. So that's different than... Um, Corporate taxation, with corporate taxation, um, there, like I said, you generally treat yourself as an employee. Um, so the corporation is going to be taking, you know, Medicare, Social Security, the payroll tax part. But on top of that, you can pay yourself profit dividends. And those profit dividends are considered to be regular income. So they are subject to fewer taxes or they, they don't include the self-employment tax piece. And so a lot of times people will... If their business is particularly successful, they will form a corporation or elect corporate taxation um, because they can basically pay a lower tax rate on their profit dividends after they pay themselves a reasonable salary. Uh, and I learned about this because I used to work for a lawyer who was a sole practitioner who one day announced that she was going to incorporate her business and I didn't understand why until I realized it was because I was working really hard for her and earning her tons of money and she wanted to pay less tax on the money that I was earning for her. So, um, by the way, this is a webinar being taught by someone with a strong critique of capitalism. Um, and this corporate taxation piece, um, generally it's, it's a way if you're capitalizing off the labor of others or capitalizing off of some other resource, that's generally when you get to the, you, you start to make profits that are high enough that you'd benefit from the corporate taxation status. Um, there's a lot more to be said about the tax stuff, but I, like I said, I'm gonna, I'm just glossing over it. Um, but with corporate taxation, there's different subcategories of it. Uh, there's C corporations, which is, it refers to subchapter T of the tax code. And C corporations are generally subject to double taxation, meaning the corporation makes profits, it pays taxes on the profits, and then it distributes dividends to its shareholders who then pay taxes on it again, which sounds kind of like a bummer. Like at, at first glance, you think, well, double taxation, why would I ever choose that? But there are benefits to it, which is just that there's a lot more flexibility in how you plan the taxes, particularly on planning when to pay them. So you can time things in ways that are, that are preferential for your business. And also the corporate tax rate is lower than the individual tax rate. So keeping profits in the business, particularly for smaller corporations, can be beneficial. 
Uh, choosing S corporation taxation means that all of the profits pass straight through to the shareholders. The corporation doesn't pay tax, uh, only the shareholders do, even the parts of the profits that aren't yet distributed to the shareholders. Um, so again, you can form a lot of different entities and then still choose these different tax statuses. So you can be an LLC and choose C corporation taxation, or you could be an LLC and and choose T corp uh, status. And T corp is my favorite, um, and very few entities use it, but it's basically a tax category designed for cooperatives. And the idea is that um, basically, there's a lot of flexibility involved in it, but if you're operating on a cooperative basis, which the IRS defines as having, you're being democratic, basically, uh, one vote per member, and you distribute the profits on the basis of patronage, which is the value or quantity of, of <coughs> business that the members do with the cooperative. So with a worker cooperative, it's distributing the profits on the basis usually of how, like the value or quantity of work that the co-op members do with consumer co-ops. It's based on um, the, usually the value of the products people bought. So basically this tax category says that if you're, just, if you're operating on a cooperative basis, then there's no double taxation. All of the taxation gets passed through to the members if there's any taxation. Um, so yeah, there's more to be said about this, but there's also a lot of flexibility for T corporations to choose to tax some of their income at the corporate level at a lower rate uh, if they want to. Um, so that's why I say it's favorable. There's a lot of flexibility in, in how it's used. Uh, but that brings me to talk a little bit about cooperatives. And I tried to draw a picture of an elephant here in case you can't tell, uh, because there's that that story or that proverb about blind people who are each touching a different part of the elephant and depending on the part that they're touching, they, they think it's something different. One person says, oh, it's a tree. Another person says, oh, it's something else. But it's kind of the same thing with cooperatives because <laughs> the word cooperative can mean so many different things just depending on who's using it. Uh, some people say, oh, it's a tax category, which it is, it's the T corporation tax category. Um, there's a few other cooperative tax categories as well. But yeah, it's also a type of corporation or entity that you can form at the state level. Um, but then a lot of things that are neither cooperative corporations nor cooperative tax status still call themselves cooperatives on the basis that they operate following certain cooperative principles or they're democratically governed and distribute their profits to members based on patronage. So all of that is to say the word cooperative, it's um, it's a complicated word, although it's one of my favorite words because I love cooperatives and I feel like they're really important to transforming the economy, um, but they can really manifest in a lot of different ways. So if you form a cooperative entity and choose a cooperative tax status, there's still a lot of room to move and decide, uh, like, what kind of cooperative are you? And that mostly shows up in how you, what you put in your bylaws as far as who can be members of the cooperative um, how you operate and so on. So worker cooperatives are the ones generally owned by the people who are doing the work. So in the case of composting, the people who are doing the composting. Um, consumer cooperatives might be, um, you know, in the composting context, people who are generating the organic material and they subscribe to some kind of hauling service, or maybe it's also, maybe it's farmers who are buying the finished compost, uh, for example. And then producer cooperatives refer to uh, situations usually where multiple businesses join together uh, to get some advantage uh, collectively, which could mean buying certain things at a lower rate together or marketing their products together. Uh, but these categories of worker co-op, consumer co-op, producer co-op, they rarely show up in the law. These are really choices that you make yourself. Um, with a few exceptions, there's a few states that now have worker co-ops as a category. Um, many states also have agricultural cooperatives as a category in their choices of entity. Uh, but yeah, the thing about cooperatives is, yeah, they show up in many ways. The Sustainable Economies Law Center, which is my nonprofit organization, we're a 501c3, we're also structured a bit like a cooperative. So 
Um, and what that means is that we've um, created democratic governance structure, we've abandoned conventional hierarchies, we also have equal pay, uh, and you can learn more about that on our website. Um, it, it doesn't look like we're all standing in a line. I mean, really, the reality of our work is that there's 15 staff and it's very much just the governance is very distributed among many different circles throughout the organization. Um, but yeah, that's a key point is that nonprofits can function very much like cooperatives if, if you want them to. Um, Oh, and I bring up this point about boards of directors because, like I said, corporations always need to have boards of directors. And the rule is that the board of directors, um, I can't remember how they phrase it, basically at the end of the day, they, they direct, they control the company. So they're kind of like the bottom line when it comes to control over the company. Um, but a lot of people avoid forming, say, nonprofits or cooperatives because they just don't like this idea of, of having to create a board of directors that would be their boss, especially people who have been the primary founder of an organization. Um, but um, I create this slide really to just explain, and, and the reality is that most boards of directors delegate the management, strategy, and most of the work to the workers of an organization or whoever's whoever's basically carrying out the organization's work. Um, so yeah, that's just to say boards of directors don't necessarily need to change the the way in which you operate, but they they at the very least do need to be there to provide oversight um, and make certain major decisions such as like pay, for example. Okay, so let me just check where we're at with time. Um, so for the purposes of getting an advantage at the policy level, I do think that many compost enterprises will do better if they choose either some kind of public benefit entity or a mutual benefit entity, basically meaning a nonprofit of some sort or a cooperative. Uh, and one of the other reasons for this, I mean, there's policy reasons for doing this, but there's also just just reasons of like the reality of our economy is that when things are structured as for-profit businesses, meaning that the owners of those business businesses can maximize their profits from the business, there's a tendency for things to become really consolidated. And we've seen this happen in a lot of other industries. We've seen water get privatized all over the world. Just looking a little bit into the future, well, I guess we can already look into the present and see giant waste management corporations uh, emerging, but we want to probably think about like how do we prevent the waste industry from becoming entirely centralized under the umbrella of a few giant corporations. And so for-profit entities are generally designed um, to maximize the profit for their shareholders. I mean, there, there are exceptions to this, and you don't always have to make that the defining uh, guidepost for your decisions. But it's very hard to ultimately prevent them, the business, from selling out to a larger business in the long run. So that's why I, I generally say creating some kind of nonprofit entity or cooperative entity, because of some of the essential elements built into those entities are much less likely to get swallowed up by for-profit businesses. Um, but the reality is it's not really, a, like if you're choosing between a public benefit and um, a mutual benefit entity, it's a little frustrating sometimes to have to choose between them. And I think that our sweet spot, um, probably for the community composting movement, but really any social change movement, is probably some kind of combination of the two. We still have to choose one cake or the other, but through our financial governance, operational policies and so on, we can mix in aspects or ingredients of the other. So you can form a nonprofit public benefit cake but then if you can't tell i tried to put like yellow swirls in a chocolate cake and then chocolate swirls in a yellow cake here so that's what's happening but yeah you can form a nonprofit, but still have a lot of the same qualities of a cooperative meaning you could have democratic self-management uh, you can have basically communities organizing nonprofits to benefit their own communities so um Similarly, you can form a cooperative entity and it doesn't have to be just for the mutual benefit of its members. There can be a lot of public benefit, movement, social change oriented 
elements to its purpose, design, mission, and so on. So, yes. Uh, and I also bring this up because of, um, maybe I'm jumping to this part too soon, but when it comes to funding, I, I, th I spend a lot of time thinking about how can foundations unlock more of their endowments to finance the you know, movement toward just transition and sustainable economies. And they can be investing their endowments by you know, making program related investments in enterprises, as long as those enterprises are, are advancing charitable purposes. But if you have cooperative enterprises that mix in a lot of public benefit, that creates an opportunity for foundations and just 501c3s in general to be providing more support to those cooperatives on the basis that there is a lot of public benefit mixed in. Um, and yeah, and, and I have, lately I've been kind of obsessed with 501c3s and a lot of it is for reasons related to policy. Um, I, I put sprinkles on, the, on top of the cake for 501c3s because there are a lot of other benefits that come with being a 501c3. Uh, it's not just about being exempt from taxes, and it's not just about getting, say, grant funding or donations. It's, it's very possible that your compost enterprises will care nothing about tax exemption or getting access to grants and donations. But there are other reasons to be a 501c3. For example, there's certain programs for debt forgiveness for people who work for 501c3s. Um, it's a lot easier for employment law reasons to have unpaid volunteers. Uh, there's also exemptions in a lot of other regulatory contexts, like financial regulations, health and safety laws, and now we're seeing organic hauling, and, and then there's access to all kinds of discount programs for 501c3s, and so there's a lot of benefits to being 501c3s. There are some limitations, but I like to really think about how can we work with those limitations in a way that still gets us access to these, these sprinkles. Um, so I'm going to talk a bit about that. I think a lot of the rest of the presentation is about, about 501c3 and if and how we can kind of stretch the boundaries of it for compost enterprises. Um, <coughs> also mentioning here 501c4s. Now, 501c4s are also tax exempt, meaning so both of these are tax exempt in that they don't pay tax on their net income. I put the sprinkles on 501c3s because they have, I mean, not only tax exemption, but um, the, the donations to 501c3s are tax deductible uh, and there are all those other benefits. But 501c4s, um, I often think of them as a fallback entity or a, not an entity, fallback tax status for, um, for activities that didn't quite fit into the boundaries of 501c3. So they're called social welfare organizations. Uh, I'll actually say just a little bit more about them in a minute. Um, yeah, but there's also, you know, the, you can form any kind of nonprofit cake, a nonprofit public benefit cake, a nonprofit mutual benefit cake. I just realized I switched the cakes on this graphic, so ignore that. But anyways, if you're paying at all any attention to the chocolate versus yellow cake distinction here, ignore this. But, but basically, you can form a nonprofit cake. Um, choosing from whatever nonprofit cakes are available in your state, and then choose to get no tax exemptions. So kind of like leaving a lot of the icing off, which basically would mean you pay tax like a regular corporation, which may not be such a bad thing if you think about it, uh, because if your main sources of income are earned income or donations from people who take the standard deduction, which by the way, thanks to the new tax bill, almost everybody in the U.S. is going to be taking the standard deduction. What that means is charitable donations will make no difference on their taxes. So all these, you know, nonprofits that are like, donate to us, it's tax deductible. Well, the reality is most people won't care about that anymore, or they shouldn't care about it anymore. Um, so if, if the main source of income from your compost enterprise is just earned income or donations from people who aren't really trying to get that deduction, um, then it really doesn't matter whether you're tax exempt or you could be a 501c4 and not worry about the charitable deduction for people. Um, 
if you if you expect to get foundation grants or if you're going to be raising money from wealthier people, then the 501c3 route is probably the way to go. But I say all of this because I think it could be very possible that in our states, in our local policy advocacy, we could advocate that compost enterprises structured as nonprofits, nonprofit corporations get certain kind of policy benefits, regardless of the tax category that they choose. Uh, for example, we've been kind of lobbying our, it's not officially lobbying, but we've been encouraging our regulators to create uh, certain exemptions for compost enterprises that are structured as nonprofit benefit, uh, nonprofit public benefit corporations in California. So we don't even mention the 501c3 part. We just say if it's a nonprofit, we think it should get special treatment. But like I said, the 501c3 tax exemption, there's a lot of benefits there. So I'm just going to talk a little bit more about how to how to take advantage of that. And I also want to say that I think that the boundaries of 501c3 law have moved quite a bit, even in the last 10 years. So if you've learned anything about 501c3 law and then what kind of activities are eligible for 501c3 status, you might need to start like relearning that because I do think it's changing. Um, and it changes in response to the problems we face as a society and the recognized solutions to those problems. So, well, I'll say a bit more about that, but obviously every day we're learning more about problems. California's on fire. We have only until 2030 to avert catastrophic climate change, et cetera, et cetera. Like these are some very, you know, clear problems that we could point to that need immediate solutions. Um, and so some of the more established types of activities that fit within the boundary of 501c3, I think that there's now a lot of room to argue that a sort of an expanded set of activities are necessary to averting a lot of the threats that we're facing, both socially and environmentally. So more on that. So how do these boundaries move? So spoiler alert, the law itself has not changed, meaning 501c3, which is a section of the tax code, hasn't been rewritten by Congress recently. Laws can also change when the IRS makes certain kinds of um, binding precedent decisions. There haven't even been that many of those lately, but you can see how the boundaries start to move just by watching what types of activities are getting tax exemption. And I'm in a position where I get to watch this a lot because I help a lot of people with their tax exemption applications, and I've seen sort of the evolution of how the IRS responds to them. So uh, so just a little um, reminder about, so nonprofits get recognition of 501c3 tax exemption by filing this form 1023. And when you do that, you, you give a lot of description of how your nonprofit operates, uh, what its purposes are, what its activities are. You send that to the IRS and then the IRS will respond and either say, well, we have questions, we're not sure if this fits the boundaries or they might just flat out reject it or accept it. But it's in that kind of back and forth that you can see where the boundaries begin to move. Um, so I'll give you an example of how, how the boundaries moved. Um, and this is the history of how the IRS has responded to land conservation activities. Initially, land land conservation was considered to be a charitable purpose if it was for public benefit, meaning like, well, public benefit meaning that the public could go onto the land and enjoy its beauty. Uh, but then later on, the IRS responded to certain land trusts that were applying for tax exemption that were saying, well, this land is, land is ecologically significant. We need to preserve it whether or not the public can go and visit it. And so in the 70s, the IRS was like, oh, okay, yeah, we can see that. Okay, ecologically significant land. All right, that's, that's cool. That's a charitable purpose. But somewhere along the way, they were like, well, farms, farms aren't ecologically significant. So these are agricultural land trusts that were trying to get a tax exemption in the 70s. Um, but somewhere along the way, the IRS changed its tune without there actually being any kind of change to the law. Um, and a conservation easement lawyer has written about this and pointed out how it evolved, but basically, eventually the IRS came around and was like, oh, okay, yeah, preserving agricultural land is a charitable purpose. And what happened in the interim was that Congress 
and various states started to pass laws that say, um, we need to protect agricultural land because there'll be threats to us as a society if we don't protect it. And because there were these sort of objective um, public statements of need to protect farmland, the IRS came around and recognized this as being beneficial to the public, and therefore they recognized it as a charitable purpose. So you can sort of start to think about how this relates to compost because, I mean, you didn't see a lot of mention of compost in, at the policy level. I don't think you saw a lot of it until very recently, but now states everywhere are saying, well, or they're hopefully soon going to be saying, we need to compost everything, and it's for reasons of soil conservation, it's for reasons of carbon sequestration, methane reduction, landfill size reduction. Um, there's a lot of, a lot of reasons that the public now is wanting to compost. Um, and so there could be a way in which the IRS might start to respond, respond to composting and recognize that, basically recognize the public benefits to it. So here's how we in our organizations can start to explore these outer boundaries or these <coughs> maybe new frontiers of 501c3. Um, and I'll sort of walk you through how a lawyer might consider it. First, you need to ask, well, um, what are the threats that we're addressing? What is the need that's not being met in society? Uh, we created this soil and compost fact sheet, which when I share the slides with you, you will be able to click on it and go see the fact sheet. Uh, or somebody who's listening can, I mean, maybe Virginia could drop the link into the, um, to the chat if you want. But in any case, we've tried to gather a lot of data about like what are the threats to soil and other other things. And then also like wh what are the ways in which compost can help address those threats or meet those needs? So the second part of the inquiry is like how does your activity have a substantial causal relation to remedying the problems that you describe or meeting the needs? So you need to show that your activity is um, maybe addressing issues of soil health or soil toxicity, if that's what you exist to remedy. Uh, but there's a lot of different approaches, I think, with compost, sort of a lot of different arguments you can make about what's the problem you're trying to solve and then how are you solving it. Uh, but then the last question is, well, are your activities exceeding any of the boundaries of 501c3? Is it larger in scope than is necessary to achieve your charitable or educational purposes? Um, so more on that, this whole concept of being larger in scope, because that's where that's where that, that could be a major pitfall for compost operations. So um, I'll just jump down to okay. So 501c3, it's for charitable, educational, religious, scientific purposes. There's a few other listed purposes. Um, you could consider many compost enterprises to be educational or scientific, of course, because we're obviously like people all over our communities need to be learning about composting and how to handle organics. And then there's also still so much to learn about just how to compost and what are the good, better ways to do it or one of the, what are the benefits to the environment. So there's a lot of scientific purposes involved. But I do worry about any compost enterprise that tries to get tax exemption on either of these bases because both will be limiting in your scale. I was once giving advice to a, an educational organization. Well, they called themselves educational. And they said, well, we're growing tomato plants as a way to teach children about growing plants. And I was like, well, okay. And, and they said, well, we're also selling the plants at a big uh, plant show. Um, and I was like, okay, well, how many tomato plants are you growing? And they said, 3,000. And I was like, whoa, wait, do you really need to go grow 3,000 tomato plants in order to teach this kindergarten class about how to grow plants? And so that's an example of an educational purpose that was actually, the activity was far larger in scale than was necessary to actually achieve that educational purpose of teaching kids how to grow plants. They didn't need to grow 3,000 tomatoes and then go sell them as a way to achieve the educational purposes. So it does mean that if, if you want to go the educational route, you might be limited in just like how large you can grow your enterprise. Same with scientific. Um, but charitable includes a lot of 
I mean, 501c3 also includes charitable activities, and that includes a lot of things, which I think give a lot more wiggle room, uh, which includes relief of the poor and underprivileged, combating community deterioration, lessening the burdens of government. So I'll say just a little bit more about those. But these are the boundaries of 501c3 that we really need to worry about. And this is where the IRS might come back and say, sorry, your compost enterprise is, for example, too commercial. Um, so as a general rule, if something, if you're doing an activity that is commonly also done by a commercial enterprise, the IRS might reject it on that basis by saying, well, if we give you tax exemption, you're going to be unfairly competing with the businesses in that space. Um, similarly, if there's too much private benefit, like a, people organizing a project for their own, sort of a, a closed group of people doing it for their own benefit, that's usually considered to be a no-no for 501c3. So I give the example of urban farms where they're farmed by and the certain like a group of people that also runs the organization and those same people eat the food. So there's not as not necessarily a focus on broad public benefit. There's too too small or insular of a group. And then of course, if there's um, the people who run the organization. If they're getting the benefit, that's called inurement, which is also a no-no for 501c3, um, where it's it's a form of private benefit, but it's a private benefit to the people who run the organization. So these are some of the boundaries we need to worry about. Uh, but I also wonder if the sweet spot for community composting might be somewhere right in the middle of this, where we're composting at a scale that starts to grow hopefully in not maybe as large as Waste Management Corporation of Texas, but you know, it grows large enough to start really having an impact on, on our waste streams and soil. Um, but that also involves people who are deeply engaged with it and benefiting from it. So this sort of overlap of commercial, private benefit, charitable, uh, it's a tricky area, but I think, I think there's room to move within it and Part of it is because what we've seen is the IRS is starting to give tax exemption to more commercial-like activities on the basis that there are market failures. So for example, the IRS used to deny tax exemption to law firms that were charging for legal services, but that's actually changed recently on the basis of the IRS recognizing that most people in the United States can't afford lawyers or meet their basic legal needs. So. Now there are 501c3 law firms that are still charging a much, much lower rate than conventional lawyers, but the IRS is giving them tax exemption by recognizing the market failure created by the legal profession. So we have market failures related to composting. We have legislators saying, we need to get all the organics out of landfills, but then we have the situation where the commercial sector's not making it happen or they're not making it happen fast enough. There's still a ton of need to be uh, composting everywhere. So we can point that out to the IRS to say, hey, this is a need and it's not being met. And so our organization exists to meet it and the 501c3 tax exemption is necessary to make it possible. Um, by the way, if, if you are composting and you can't make the case that it's related to your charitable purposes or if it's like a small part of what you do and you're earning money from it, you know, nonprofits can still have some unrelated activities that they pay taxes on, as long as it doesn't become a substantial part of what you do. So just kind of a small part of your activities. Um, but I'm giving most of this, my last part of the presentation to argue that I, I actually think composting can be related to the exempt purpose, um, meaning you don't have to pay this unrelated business income tax on it uh, on the basis that it is advancing certain charitable purposes. Um, so yeah, about the, the private benefit pitfall, yeah, if it is a bunch of community members who are largely composting for their own benefit, that can create a problem with getting 501c3 status. Um, but I also think that the private benefit round, like we can start to push the boundaries there in part because of a very, what I, what I think is a much enlarged charitable class of people who at this point in history in the United States because of inequality, because of, well, because of so many things, so many of the things that we're facing 
um, are basically economically precarious. So many people don't have savings. Uh, there's a lot of job instability. There's the you know potential for real estate market crash. There's a lot of people who are economically precarious, such that if we're creating compost enterprises that do workforce development or that do um, enterprise like incubating new compost enterprises, that could be considered a charitable purpose, even if it's benefiting private individuals on the basis that those individuals are economically precarious. They might not even be poor, um, but they they might be facing threats of some sort. Uh, thanks for posting that, Virginia, the fact sheet. Um, you can also uh, feel free to just post a link to the slideshow now, actually, because I think it's public already. Um, okay, so... Um, one other category of charitable activity is lessening the burdens of government. This could be a significant one for composting because basically if a governmental entity says we need to do something and basically making a statement that it's the burden of the government to do something like get organics out of landfills, and particularly if there's a statement that the government itself is not able to achieve it, then a nonprofit that comes along, and especially when the nonprofit is partnering with the government in some way, um, that can generally get 501c3 status um, on the basis that it's lessening the burden of government. But I, I worry about this as a category because it's very dependent on the government, meaning <laughs> you can get tax exemption if you can point to a specific governmental entity that wants you to be doing this work. Uh, and you know, these things can change and they might change over time. Um, so I will say my, my favorite, and when I say favorite, this is like very lawyerly thing to say, like my favorite category of charitable activity, because I think there's the most room to move within it, is this concept of combating community deterioration. So, Organizations get tax exemption on the basis that they combat community deterioration, either deterioration that's already happened or deterioration that is threatened. And so if you think about all of the, uh, let me see. Well, basically think about all of the threats that we're facing uh, if we don't compost. Um, starvation, environmental destruction, you know, there's a lot of like water saving issues, water pollution, starvation disease. So there's a lot of things, a lot of threats if we don't compost. Um, if we focus on those threats and then focus on how our organizations are addressing them, I think we many more compost organizations could get 501c3 exemption by basically saying that they're addressing those threats. So it's informative to kind of compare 501c3s and 501c4s here because um, a main difference is you can get 501c3 tax exemption if you point to how, how you're making the community better in the context of things getting bad, as opposed to 501c4s, which is just like you're making the community better just because, because it's a nice thing to do. So this fine distinction is where the IRS starts to draw the, long, the line between 501c3 and 501c4s. If you can point to a threat and you're point to addressing that threat, they they are more likely to give you 501c3 status. But if there's no threat, you're just doing something nice for the community, they're, they're less likely to view that as charitable. So we actually had this summer intern whose main job it was, and I, I felt really bad because I was like, basically this is gonna be depressing all summer long, but I need you to gather data on how things are getting worse. So not just about how they're bad now, but how they're getting worse. So she produced actually multiple fact sheets and this is data that we use when we're helping people apply for tax exemption to basically point to the threats and how our clients are addressing them. Um, so that's the combating community deterioration, combating sort of environmental deterioration. So you can use data, but you could also use public policy. Like I said, all these new policies are being made, so you can point to them to say, look, there's a lot of public interest in composting. So... The last thing I will say is, uh, okay, let me just, my last slides here are a little bit out of order. Where do I want to go? Um, I'm going to just sort of 
throw it out there. And this is maybe we can start the conversation here. I think there may, I'm trying to think, is there an ideal kind of cake for composting? As in, is there an ideal entity, tax, et cetera, structure? And it might be 501c3s, well, nonprofits with 501c3 icing that have participatory management by the people who are doing the composting. And the reason for this is, one is because I do think 501c3s will ultimately get the greatest policy advantages as compost laws are being made throughout the country. Um, but I actually think like highly participatory, very cooperative management is a better way to do composting. And the reason for this, okay, here's my little Wendell. Well, okay, here's two pieces um, of evidence for that, which is just that, well, Eleanor Ostrom, who studied the management of commons around the world, you know, water resources, grazing resources, has basically said that if you really want to protect a resource, steward it in the long term, the best way to do it is to have the community be highly involved in it. Um, and she basically created the set of principles for the management of the commons, many of which point to the people who are impacted or involved with a particular resource are the ones who are making the rules, participating in decisions, that there's group self-governance. Um, yeah, this all relates to this, this question of of whether or not there's potentially private benefit or even benefit to insiders and how an organization is run. Um, whereas typically a 501c3 would have, have problems if say a group of composters in a community composting for their own benefit were also the people who formed the nonprofit and ran it. Um, that in many ways is the ideal situation. So how do we, how do we, um, sorry, I'm starting to get a little inarticulate here, but yeah, how do we create compost enterprises where the people who are doing the composting, the people who are benefiting from the composting are also the people who are um, running the organization, governing the organization. And it's a little bit of a mismatch for 501c3, but the reason I think we can do it is because of evidence that we can better combat community deterioration by having the community impacted be the one governing it. And so we can point to Eleanor Ostrom. I also had this aha moment when I was reading Wendell Berry's essay or lecture. It's a lecture called It All Turns on Affection. Um, such a beautiful piece. But one part of the piece that really struck me was that he talked about how much affection he has for soil and about if he causes just a little bit of soil erosion on his farm, he's like devastated. He's so sad. Um, and it's because he touches that soil. He, you know, is really involved in stewarding it. Whereas if he hears about soil depletion elsewhere, it doesn't really faze him. So I, you know, I experienced this when my landlord paved over our yard. Uh, you know, there's just a little patch of grass and garden in the yard and our landlord paved over it. Also, incidentally, took away my compost bin. But in any case, um, you know, I realized I had affection for these things after it happened. And it, and it told me that if you have affection for something but no power over it, you just end up with disappointment. Um, if you have power over something, like my landlord did, but you don't have affection for it, like you don't touch it, you're not there with it, then you're more likely to destroy it. Uh, but if you have affection, over, affection for something and the power over it, then you end up with stewardship, which is I think what we need for composting, sort of building a composting commons, which is Basically, the moral to that story is I think, you know, even if we're choosing 501c3s and even if they have a lot of limitations, I think it's the people who are composting that should have the power. And we were starting to make the argument in California that worker owned cooperatives should also get special treatment uh, at the level of compost policy. And the justification for that is just that if it's the owners of the enterprise who are also the ones touching the compost every day, like making sure it's not contaminated, making sure it's done well, that we'll actually get a better outcome. Like the compost product will be better if it's worker owned or just if the people who are doing the composting are the ones governing the organization. So yes, this is my way of asking, is there an ideal cake for composting? And it might be this. Um, 
and then we can also ask the broader question of just like, are there other objective criteria we can use um, when lobbying policymakers? And that's also, that's more of a question for like joining the policy subcommittee that ILSR is coordinating. But um, yeah, I think I will just stop there and yeah, hear what questions and thoughts people have. Great, Janelle, thank you so much. Um, you certainly gave, to follow up on your cake analogy, you gave us a lot to chew on and thanks for identifying some of those sweet spots. So um, <laughs> we have a few questions coming in, feel free. We're gonna go to uh, 3.30 East Coast time, another 20 minutes. So keep typing your questions in, I think we'll be able to get to all of them. And um, while, um, uh, uh, questions are coming in. I'll ask the first one, but we have a few polling questions that Virginia is going to put up. We want to do those now before too many more of you are signing off. So the first question is just to take your pulse on how useful this webinar was to you. So on a scale of one to five, where uh, five is very helpful and one is not so helpful and give us a few seconds to get that up. But uh, while we're doing that, um, Okay, let's see. Poll in progress. Okay, it's looking pretty great. Uh, thank you for participating. And we have three quarters of you participating, so let's just show the results. Mostly fours and fives. Um, great. And then the next question is, we just want to uh, see how our uh, how well we're doing on outreach. So if you could tell us how you heard about this webinar, was it through ILSR's email, direct email, was it through our social media, was it through uh, Janelle's organization or through some other means? Just help us see how well we're doing. And so far, it looks like it's mostly email outreach. Go ahead and show the results, Virginia. 86% um, through our emails. All right, we'll keep doing that. And then the last question is, uh, we'll be offering uh, another in this series for policy legal issues. And we wanna get a sense from you of uh, where we might focus our next webinar. So um, if if you don't see your issue here, please email us and, and uh, let us know what we're missing. But these are some of the issues that came up um, when we did our previous polling earlier in the summer in June. So um, uh, so let's see, only half of you have voted. Please continue to vote. So Janelle, um, while that's coming in and Virginia can show the results, um, uh, one of the things that, well, actually, before I ask you the question, I just want to also let folks, I didn't mention um, that we did a webinar almost a year ago or more than a year ago, September 20th, and we did feature one worker-owned cooperative zero in Massachusetts, as well as we had Eric Lombardi from EcoCycle in Boulder, Colorado, talking about social enterprises, and that was recorded, so please look for that on our on our website. And um, Janelle mentioned this the sweet spot of, 501c3s, nonprofits with 501c3 icing and some kind of participatory kind of management. And I will just say that one of the, seems to me to be one of the growing parts of the community composting sector is worker-owned cooperatives. So in addition to zero, um, you know, some of the others are Fertile Ground in Oklahoma City. We have the Petal People Cooperative in um, also in Massachusetts and Roots Composting in Flagstaff, Arizona. So there's a number of models around the country. So check those out too. And one of the questions we had, Janelle, is, you know, based on the points um, that you made, would you consider the Zero Cooperative an example of one of the best? Yeah, I love that example. I think that it would be interesting to ask them if they ever feel like they're missing out on some benefit by not being a 501c3. But yeah, what I love is just that the workers all own the business. And so every person who's handling the organic material and the compost is somebody who owns the business and has that pride of ownership, that affection for what they're doing. Um, and so it's also very possible that in Massachusetts, and I think I did hear this is true, or is it Boston where they're operating? Just that the, the laws have been a lot more friendly to smaller scale, more diverse business structures operating. The problem we have in Oakland, California, is just that 
um, no other business is allowed to collect and haul organic material other than this giant corporation waste management. And so um, I would love to see something like Sarah um, get off the ground in Oakland, but right now they just wouldn't be able to. Um, yeah. Okay. Uh, thumbs up for worker-owned cooperatives. Um, yeah. And uh, okay, one question. Another question is, can you be an LLC but have a 501c3 tax status? Yeah, that's a very good question. It shows that somebody was listening when I was talking about how you can mix and match cake and icing. There are limitations to that. That is one of the that's one kind of cake and icing combination that you will almost never see. There's a few exemptions where, for example, some LLCs have gotten 501c3 tax exemption if they're owned by 501c3 and if they're doing affordable housing, so really specific circumstances. So um, generally to get 501c3 status, the IRS does look at what type of entity you chose and they wanna make sure that it's very carefully um, limited to ensure public benefit as opposed to private benefit. So LLCs are almost always privately owned by individuals, but not always. Okay, and there's another a question related to LLC, so I'll ask that now. Uh, question, I currently have an LLC, but I'm working towards developing a much larger compost site, I probably with municipal partnership. Does working with the municipality bring up any red flags? Hmm. I'm sure someone else might have opinions on that one because I don't know if this is so much of a question related to entity choice, uh, although it might, like if you think you'll get better um, or preferential treatment from the municipality on the basis of being a nonprofit or a cooperative, you might want to consider that. Well, so for example, in, in Berkeley right now, we're trying to pass an ordinance that gives preferential contracting to cooperatives. Um, so it, in that kind of situation, being a cooperative would be um, more strategic than being an LLC. Um, but yeah, generally partnering with municipalities, I'm sure comes with all kinds of other requirements, hurdles, pitfalls that I probably can't speak to as well as maybe others who, who might have partnered with municipalities. Yeah. And I think Janelle, your point about it may not be a corporate structure um, issue you know, uh, local government can offer land and good deals on land, but it's not how your your entity is structured, but there's maybe some beneficial partnerships. Okay, so, um, all right, another question, quote, I have a very specific question about structuring a partnership between a 501c3 and a sole proprietor, proprietor and they wanna know if it's okay, if they can shoot you an email for advice on this. So, are uh, you getting out? Yeah, go ahead. The problem with me an email is that so many people shoot me emails. I'm really bad at responding. We do have the intention, though. I mean, Sustainable Economies Law Center has the intention <laughs> to be more of a resource to composters around the country. We just don't yet have capacity to. And that's part of why we've partnered with ILSR and we're trying to raise you know, more money to keep doing this work. Uh, one of our goals, especially if we have more capacity, is actually to just start identifying who, what lawyers, or legal support resources exist in every state to help you answer these questions. Um, but yeah, I think it's it's good that you're thinking about these questions um, about partnerships between sole proprietorships and 501c3s because that's always a sticky area. And I will say the general the general theme you always want to keep in mind if you're working with a 501c3 and a non 501c3 is that the 501c3 really can't exist or be set up to benefit private individuals or private enterprises. You really need to have kind of arm's length transactions between multiple entities where the 501c3 is always making a decision based on its best interest and not based on say benefiting a private enterprise. So, so it's good that you're asking questions about this even if you email me and I don't respond. Um, I would say keep looking in your own state for other people with this nonprofit law expertise in particular. Good. All right, uh, Janelle, can you speak about the options for embedding a 501c6 or other 501c within a 501c3 or vice versa to segregate educational and scientific activities from the profit-making lobbying and other non-501c3 activities? Yeah. So this is a kind of, this is a similar situation to what I was just mentioning with 501c3s 
sort of transacting with or partnering with non 501 C3s is there always needs to be kind of a, an arm's length relationship between the two of them where the 501 C3 is basically entering into partnerships or transactions on the basis that it best advances the charitable educational scientific purposes of the 501 C3, if that makes sense. So if I can, um, I'm going to try if I think if I can be a little bit more concrete with that. Um, well, first of all, I do want to mention that th for things like lobbying and also profit making, these are things that 501 C3s can do. So 501 C3s can do a small amount of lobbying. There's different tests for what the limits are there. Um, and then the profit making, um, if you are separating it out because you've already identified that it's not going to be what the IRS considers related to the charitable educational scientific purposes, then that, that's probably a good thing to break it into another, another en entity. Um, but I think one of the, the key points I was trying to make, but maybe didn't make it very articulately in this presentation, is I do think 501c3s can earn profit. They can earn revenue income from their activities as long as they can still make the case that they're within the boundaries of 501c3 law, meaning like their activity is not larger in scope than is necessary to carry out the charitable purposes. And if, if, particularly if the charitable purposes are combating community deterioration and um, and you're really pointing to a lot of the threats of like what would happen in society if we don't compost, then my my hope is that there's a lot of room for 501c3s to be engaging in profit making activity. Um, sorry, that was a very that was a kind of a a long winded kind of disorganized answer to that question. But um, you're good, you're good, Janelle. Yeah. Um, I mean, there's there's a lot of moving parts here, and you covered a lot of ground. And I just have to say, your cake analogy was just so brilliant. So, and you know, I didn't I didn't say it earlier, but we know as composters how important recipes are. And I think most of us didn't realize, in terms of corporate structure, how recipes also play such a key, you know, critical role. And um, mm -hmm. the ingredients and um, and everything. So I think I think you, uh, it's, it's been fabulous. Okay, so a few more questions since we have a few more minutes. Um, what sort of zoning ex exemptions will a 501c3 composting operation see in California? If you have any insights to that, you know, mm -hmm. go ahead and share. Um, I will say I've seen a few examples of zoning laws that give special treatment to 501c3s when it comes to urban farming. So there might be a differentiation in some zoning laws between urban farming and community gardening, where if it's a 501c3 doing the garden, it's considered community gardening, whereas if it's for a profit making organization, it might be considered urban farming. So these are some <laughs> distinctions that are starting to appear in zoning laws. Um, and I think the idea is, well, the zoning laws, zoning laws are really made by thinking about what's the impact on the surrounding community or how does this affect the quality and character of a neighborhood. And there's an understanding that if a nonprofit is doing something, it's doing something with a lot of consideration to its impact on the surrounding community, usually. Whereas if a for-profit enterprise is doing something, it's generally oriented to making profit for its shareholders and there's going to be less consideration to how does it affect the neighbors or how does it benefit the broader community and that's why I do think um, 501c3s that are engaging in composting might have an advantage if they if they lobby for zoning laws that that basically allow for 501c3s to operate composting facilities in areas where for-profit composting facilities may not be allowed. I haven't seen this in fact I've barely seen zoning laws that reference composting but as that starts to change we can we can build in some advantages for nonprofits yeah and one thing I'll say zoning has come up quite a bit and for community composters and and actually larger scale composters and most zoning is local not state and um, there is um, even the US composting council is hopefully taking up this issue and coming up with some um, model language that can be shared uh, but they will probably unlikely be looking at you know community composting and the kind of 501c3 status so it's something we should we should be uh, following closely um, okay I think we have just two more questions which we can squeeze in um, one question is 
Uh, would you be able to suggest if laws for worker-owned cooperatives are favorable in the Northeast, like New York specifically? Mm -hmm. You know, I don't know of any compost-related laws that have yet to call out worker cooperatives and give them an advantage. I've seen um, cooperatives of, like, neighbors, for example, like in California, there's an exemption where neighbors get together and compost with each other and they're not subject to air related regulations related to compost. Um, but I haven't seen anything else worker co-op related. I mean, worker co-ops have other advantages like in New York City. I think the city's invested or basically donated $8 million toward worker cooperative development over the last, I think, four years. Um, and so there's those kinds of advantages. There's a growing recognition at the policy level that that worker cooperatives bring a lot of benefits to communities. So I think riding that wave, once it really picks up, riding that wave of interest by policymakers could be also a good move. Okay. Um, I have a question just on worker owned cooperatives. I think it's, is, is there state policy or law that we could be supporting to support um, worker owned cooperatives? You know, are there differences by state? Mm -hmm. Well, there, we just got passed a federal law that starts to allocate more um, small business development funds toward worker cooperative development. <laughs> development. Um, it's called the Main Street Something Something Act, um, sponsored by Senator Gillibrand. Uh, but I think we need similar laws at the state level that basically dedicate more state resources funding and small business development center resources toward worker co-op development. Um, there are a few states with special entities for worker co-ops. We created one in California. I think Massachusetts also has one. There's one other state. Uh, and, and by creating a special entity for worker co-ops, it does create something that's a little bit more tailored to the unique governance needs of worker co-ops, also unique needs related to raising capital and employment law. Uh, but it's not I would say it's not like the highest priority um, as far as advancing worker ownership. I think the highest priority might be just dedicating more public resources to funding and developing worker co-ops. Okay. And that sounds good. Opinion. I'm sure the worker co-op community has a lot of other opinions. Okay. Um, uh, we had a few questions that I consider kind of outside the, um, uh, the, the, the scope of, of our webinar today, but I'll just end with, so I'm not going to ask those. If for those who asked those and you didn't get it answered, you can uh, shoot us an email uh, separately at ILSR and we can see if we can refer you to the right people. Um, but the uh, one question we have is um, somebody who wants to know if they can get exemption like vermicomposting in California and what type of entity can get most favorable treatment. Uh, it's kind of an open-ended question, so I don't know if you have any kind of general thoughts on that. Mm. Well, I think we have a lot of a, we have a big role to play in shaping who gets favorable treatment. And in my experience, I mean, well, first of all, we as composters all around the country need to be organizing and be, be in conversation with regulators and policymakers as new laws are getting made, but also to change the existing laws to the extent that they don't carve out a space for community scale composting. So I think a lot of this is up to us, but in my experience of about eight years of policy advocacy, I will say it's, it's quite easy. Well, it can be easy to get special treatment for 501c3s, and we've seen that in a lot of areas of law. Um, it can be sometimes easy to get special treatment for cooperatives, but there's also the problem that cooperatives are widely misunderstood. As I mentioned, there's a lot of, a lot of different understandings of what that word even means. Um, so, so I would say like we, we just need to be doing more education, public education, education of policymakers about what all these things are and what the benefits are. Um, but the reason why I suggested our sweet spot might be to try to fit ourselves into 501c3 entities more often is because I think there'll be more policy favorable treatment. Also want to add the disclaimer, because I never said it, that a lot of this is like really new, new legal territory. So as you're venturing into it, if you decide to go the 501c3 route based on some of the stuff I've said, know that you still might get rejected by the IRS. Know that you need to choose your words carefully when you're applying. And if you get rejected, then just go with another option. But um, 
yeah, just wanted to let everyone know this is it's uncharted legal territory, which can be a little scary, but I think it's also a very exciting time for the community compost movement. Great. Well, that's a great note to end on, Janelle. So once again, Janelle, thank you so much for walking us through uh, all of these various uh, pros and cons of the different structures and layers of the cake and ingredients and icing and sprinkles. And um, all of you attendees, thanks for staying on to the very end. And uh, look, look for our next series of webinars. And so happy Thanksgiving, everyone. Thank you. Okay.